him. He's a very brave guy. There's, there's letters from Frederick that say Thursday and Friday, and I was thinking, why didn't he put the date? But it's actually quite easy, because I think he was only there for one Thursday and one Friday. And in the flying corps, they didn't train these guys properly. They were sent up and um, then they were shot down. My mother had told me about her uncles, but only in passing, very briefly. They, they had been killed and it was a very bad situation. So we go to George's. I was uh, in Ireland, in Dublin, and this book, which was rather strange, appeared in the bookshelf. I looked at it and to my astonishment were her two uncles, and they were listed as having been killed in the First World War. Frederick was 22, killed on the 21st of August, 1917. Uh, he was in the Royal Flying Corps, but he'd only been in it for a week. Old, Royal Dublin Fusiliers. George was 19 when he was killed. He was killed on the ground on the 16th of August, 1917. George is here. They were killed within five days of each other, and that got my attention. And this was before I was a filmmaker. Hij zou gebeld worden deze namiddag door de heer Donal D O N A L Fernandez. En Donal Fernandez is iemand die bezig is met een filmproject fictie Eerste Wereldoorlog. In terms of uh, the In Flanders Fields Museum, yes, uh, I've explained about the situation with the script and mm -hmm. the possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, if I email In Flanders Fields Museum, a short we, synopsis. Yes, yes. Let's say that the the museum is certainly interested in being involved in the project. Last year, I'd been told through my mother, who had one or two documents, and she said her brother had more. We don't even know how long they've been there, maybe 10, 20 years. And I actually found hundreds of documents, letters, and actually the whole lifetime of my two great uncles. Everything from when they were babies, all the way up to when they died, till after they died, and it was all preserved. Uh, most of it preserved perfectly and it was like their mother obviously kept everything and wanted it to be remembered I think uh, but she didn't live long after the war she died within five years and then the other brothers and the family were too young really to remember so it just got forgotten like it did for so many families from the first world war Dominic Dungeon. Then I thought, well, why not pick this idea up of my uncle's because it's been on in my head for some years. And then I really started to research. I've hurt my back yesterday evening, so I'm walking very difficult. It's good to meet you. The younger brother was exposed to the heaviest use of mustard gas by the Germans against the British. One of the names for mustard gas is Ypres because it's from Ypres, 
the association is so strong. What we have here is a whole month yeah. uh, of yellow cross, which is mustard gas, yeah. and systematic night attacks on British positions, including targets in the rear, mm -hmm. which actually means carpet bombing almost with, with artillery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's artillery, it's artillery yeah. I mean, yeah. nearly every soldier who was on the front in 1917 will have experienced gas in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. They will all have. Yeah, it's just a degree of intensity. Yes, it's just, it's uh, that's, that's the problem with, that's the problem with gas, of course. It's mm -hmm. uh, and certainly with mustard gas, which, which would have been everywhere then. The reverse orientation. Mm -hmm. So this is no man's land? Mm -hmm. These are the German lines? It's just before oh, this the uh, Russian gas was deployed, I think. This, yeah. is, this is like more or less the day before. Again, George wrote in his own prior. words that the his exact phrase was he felt pretty Which rotten. Sense, the effect on the mother devastated her to find out that her son was victim of chemical weapons because this was the first she knew of it. Bearing in mind that she knew her son was in pain, but she didn't know how. So you had even that psychological terror of the unknown, which is maybe the thing about chemical weapons, which is the, the worst thing. That because the effects are so varied, so pernicious. Uh -huh. It's the right area, right day. Yeah. Uh, 21st. 21st of August 17. Frenzenburg. And it gives you the original. Mm -hmm. Front line and no man's land, mm -hmm. um, and also the strong points. And the starting line on the 16th was because I think your 16th is when they. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. That's the original. One. Covered. By then, your family members were, were killed. First one was killed on the 16th in the morning, so yeah, it so would, be, would be. Here. So depends, they did, they it did actually. If he was killed in action or. Um, killed in action. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he advanced something like 100 meters before he was uh, shot. So this red line here is very the ground zero for what I'm looking for, I guess. Yes. yes. Yeah. George's unit Meters was trying to take this objective. He was advancing in this direction, so it must have happened fairly close to it's this. It's either point. here or in that direction. In that direction. Yeah. And the, the bit work would have been heavily defended by the Germans. I mean, yeah. they would have had machine guns there. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, he was shot in the chest, so my guess is he was advancing and they just yeah. shot him. Uh, the open field? Yes. It's, it's easy it's shot. Easy, yeah. Yeah. Easy target. yeah. It's a dry day and you can see what it's like. And if it had been raining continually for three weeks, he was expected to tiptoe from shell hole to shell hole. Mm against a multiple machine gun emplacement. No wonder he died. Now they are still focused on present day during system. And even with that modern system, see what is happening now. Yes. After a, a few days of rain, fields can be completely flooded and farmers still can have a lot of problems. And they find, obviously, the munitions keep coming. Every spring, the moment the farmers start to work on their fields again, mm -hmm. every now and then the farmer hears a cling on his tractor, he has touched something, metal on metal. Mm -hmm. And then the farmer says, oh my God, not again. Mm -hmm. So he has found an, an unexploded shell. Mm -hmm. He leaves it there, phones the bomb disposal squad, they come and collect those shells. And in spring we see them touring around daily, because every day someone will have found something. We still talk about tons and tons of unexploded ammo per year. Most of the shells that they find is uh, conventional ammunition. Mm -hmm. And if they do find a, uh, well, the phosgene or Boston gas, I guess. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, in total, we talk about 30 kinds of gases, mixtures of phosgene, whatever. Yeah. Um, but don't forget that all armies have used gas. In the beginning, when it was started, it was meant as a weapon to provoke a breakthrough, and one way of realizing a breakthrough is introducing a new weapon. And if we win the war, that was the German logic, 
with that new weapon, even if it's a dreadful weapon, then a lot of lives will be saved. But that's the logic that is always it's formed always in, in a war. Yeah. And you see actually what happens when war, when, when gas was introduced in April 1915, you see three consequences. And these are three consequences which you see in every war and every time a new weapon is introduced. And that is a, a protection. Uh, there is no protection during the first gas attack. And then you've got a whole evolution and a very swift development of different types of gas masks. Uh, secondly, retaliation. Well, if you can use it, we can as well. So what you see is that by the end of the war, uh, the Allies would have used as much gas as the Germans. Um, and then the third consequence, which you see in every war, is that when a new weapon is introduced, this weapon will be more and more developed, will get more and yeah, more sophisticated. Arms race. Yeah, um, within a war. Mm -hmm. So what you see is 1915, it's chloric gas, suffocating. Towards the end of 1915, it's phosgene gas, still suffocating but stronger. And then 1917, mustard gas, completely new agent, um, which burns all the weak parts of the body. So mm -hmm. it's not only suffocating, but yeah. it means that you're no longer sufficiently protected with a gas mask. You know when it starts, mm -hmm. and there is a basic idea why they start using it, but then it's just, it grows. It goes out of control. Grow, yeah, code of, of control. There was nothing to protect the civilians. Just imagine if a cloud of that chlorine gas would have drifted into Ypres, thousands of civilians would have been killed. And therefore, all the civilians that were still around in Ypres were evacuated. The story that I know best was my grandmother's story. Mm -hmm. She lived in Ypres. She left Ypres on the 15th of May, 1915, was evacuated to France, deep in France, Le Havre, with my father and my uncle, still young boys then, and they stayed in France for the rest of the war. And then after the war, they returned to Ypres. As a widow, unfortunately, my grandfather was a regular soldier in the Belgian army. He was hit by a shell uh, in near the Belgian North Sea coast, was taken to hospital and died in uh, Calais, in hospital in France. This is something that I have never shown to anyone else. The last letter of my grandfather. The date, 24th of October, 1914. He died, one o'clock in the afternoon. He says, <clears throat> I've been hit by a, by a shell. I have done everything I could to reach you and to get you here in the hospital. I kiss you and also our kids. We will meet again in heaven. At the time, Frederick and the younger brother George joined up. Ireland, as it is now, the Irish Republic, was part of Britain. There was no border, there was no Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. It was all the British Isles, or United Kingdom. And they just saw themselves as being part of the United Kingdom. It's about 38 metres tall, I think, if I remember. Uh, the stone is darker than the rest of you know, the buildings. My father is from Goa. He married my mother, who was Anglo-Irish. My father left uh, when I was quite small, so I was cut off. And in her case, Anglo-Irish has a lot of meanings. It means that you're at, you live in Ireland, you're from Ireland, but there's some connection to the United Kingdom as well. There it is. 
I need to turn the, uh, I have to turn the car around. Maybe the reason I'm doing your film is because of my parentage. I was always fearful that I didn't belong. Okay, wait. Ah, I live with Say they'd lived and that my uncles came home. What were they coming home to? They were coming home to a country that didn't exist when they started and which would absolutely reject everything that they'd just done and suffered for. new state of Ireland. They were ashamed of everything that the Irish regiments had done in the, in the Great War because it was fighting under the British flag. Yes. This has got the record of every Irishman who was killed. They're all listed here by alphabetical order. Flackett, Lahadi, Fitzgerald. Falconer, George Stride. Second Lieutenant Royal Dublin Fusiliers, killed in action, friends and mine. I hear this from other people who have mixed backgrounds, Operation always, that, that one side doesn't consider them to belong to them, and then they go to the other side and they think the same. If you have a mixed background, you, you, who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? 